Hello everyone and welcome to my channel. In this video, I'd like to share with you a new way of approaching fluid flow governing equations. Unlike classical methods, this one is nice and easy. So let's see how it works. Anytime we're given a fluid in motion, we begin the analysis by sketching a small virtual control volume fixed in space and of constant dimensions. Being inside the flow, the control volume is already filled with fluid particles. For the sake of simplicity, we assume the fluid moving in one direction and is made up of only two particles. Call its mass mcv. Outside the control volume, the flow approaching its boundary also carries particles. Assume one particle reaching the edge. Consider all particles made up of identical mass and let this stage be stage 1, which occurs at time t equals to t0. Due to the ongoing flow, the external particle moves inside the control volume, pushing the internal ones in the same direction. Pausing at this stage and marking it as stage 2 with time t equals to t1, we clearly notice that MCV remains the same in both stages, thus is still made up of two particles and therefore maintaining its initial mass. Using simple English, we start asking ourselves what, when, how, and where. Answering the first question, what happened is some sort of event. The event that took place here is the control volume losing one particle while gaining another of the same mass. The concept is widely known as the law of conservation of mass. Now we consider either the loss or the gain and proceed to the next question. When did this happen? The answer, of course, focuses only on time or a certain period of time. So if we consider the loss, the answer would be from time t0 to time t1. Call this mass change or loss delta mcv and the period of time associated with it delta t. We now perform the mathematical operation on the entire equation. Moving forward, we now ask ourselves how? How did all this happen? The answer to how is a particular process. The process here is the external particle moving into the control volume. So motion is the key here, which leads us to ask the following question, which is where? Where did this happen? As we see motion inside the control volume took place from 0 or x equals to 0 to x1. Call it delta x as a reference to change. And crossing a certain distance definitely needs time, which is here the same duration in which the mass loss had taken place. Thus, it's delta t. This implies a speed let's call it u. So our equation now is the first term being the mass loss due to time and the second term being the mass gain due to motion which allows us to replace delta t by delta x over u only for the second term. Our equation now is in the following form. To have it equal to zero, however, the term due to loss is negative. So a good idea is to flip the signs of both terms as if multiplying the whole expression by minus one. And now we are able to remove the minus sign and include it as a part of the term itself. The difference is simple with the minus sign as before delta mcv over delta t can only be positive but now it can bear both signs 
However, since it's loss, then it is in itself negative. We now arrive at the form which looks like this, with the second term accounting only for a uniform velocity, which is not necessarily the case. What if the external particle is entering in a varying velocity? So to account for a varying velocity, this velocity change will be associated with the mass of the control volume making up those particles. Now according to the formula, u v prime equals to u prime v plus v prime u, we can arrange the two terms to the right to look as follows. On a differential scale, delta is replaced by d. We only have one mass, so we can cross out cv and keep it as m. And since the control volume has constant dimensions, then its volume is constant. So we are allowed to divide the whole expression by v. And putting v inside the differentiated terms won't change the situation at all. Mass over volume is the density rho. And now we are done with the one-dimensional form of the continuity equation. Now to generalize it into three dimensions, we add two more terms. The second term representing the speed v in the y direction. The third one representing the speed w in the z direction. The change of notation from d to the curly d is usually implemented to help spot the difference between ordinary differential equations and partial differential equations, the former involving one independent variable x and the latter involving more than one, in our case x, y, and z. Using calculus rules, we can have the terms including motion packed together into a compact form using the divergence theorem, where u is the three-dimensional velocity vector, and we will arrive to the following form. So I hope this was helpful. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. Thank you for watching and see you in later videos.